Welcome back to our workshop on plant diversity, climate change, and conservation in California. Um, we've talked about history of climate, history of California, environmental history of California, and in the last three modules, we'll be digging into how biodiversity responds to climate change, the role of fine scale landscapes, and then how the conservation is adapting. So getting more into the biology. If we look at any plant species um, and we get out a range map, which we might find in a field guide, or look at the samples that are found in an herbarium collection, or if we look on iNaturalist and look at where it's all, you know, we, we have lots of different ways of looking at where plants and animals live. But of course, any species has some finite geographic distribution. So here we have blue oak, a beautiful California endemic tree of our oak savannas. And on the right is a approximate map, approximate map of where blue oak is found. It's kind of like a field guide in, if you picked up a field guide to birds, you know, there's not a blue oak every single place within that green area, right? So what we really mean is this is the zone where if you go into that zone, you will find blue oak woodlands, you know, maybe scattered across the landscape along with other things. Um, but the important thing is like, look at that, you know, the, look at that distribution. This is actually a classic California. Many of you are familiar with the bathtub ring distributions of plants in California foothill woodlands that live in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, foothills of the coast range, but not in the Central Valley now because of agriculture. But even previously, it would have been too wet, too marshy, although there might have been more, more you know, more oaks down in there. But the question is, when you look at it, you say, well, so why that shape? Why does blue oak have that range? Why does it have those limits? What keeps it from spreading? Or why isn't it narrower? This is a fundamental core question of ecology. The causes of the distribution of plants and animals has always been at the center of ecology, distribution and abundance. And actually, some of these ranges in California are pretty unusual shapes, but this all relates to the climate maps we've been looking at and the unusual the shape of the distant climate zones. And that's to say that, especially for these dominant trees like blue oaks and the conifers that form the major habitats of California, climate is a dominant factor. One place where we know this really well is, and not just in California, but all around the world, is when we go up in elevation, we see these very distinctive climate zones from low elevation to high elevation. And these actually mirror the climate zones going from lower latitude. If we went, you know, if we if we went all the way down here, if we could go to warmer and warmer, we could get to the tropics even. But the vegetation from the equator up to the poles, from the from mid latitude, you know, lower latitude to high latitude, is mirrored by the vegetation from lower elevation to higher elevation. And this was actually one of the fundamental insights of Alexander von Humboldt in his founding work on biogeography before Darwin in the early 19th century. But when we look in California, we see these, um, these typical zones from foothill woodlands, blue oak, we get into chaparral, gray pine comes into the chaparral, then we move into ponderosa, sugar pine, come up a little higher, you get white fir and then red fir, then the trees get a little smaller, more lodgepole pine, get up into white bark and subalpine, and then above tree line, or at least above the tree line because there's no soil, as we talked about in an earlier module. And really, this reflects this, you know, this really strong climate gradient, both temperatures getting cooler, rainfall changing. And this is the kind of gradient, and when we talk about a gradient, just meaning, you know, a, a pattern across the landscape that can help us understand the causes of distributions and then understand how climate change will have effects. In ecology, um, ecologists divide the, the factors that, that the, the causes of the limits of geographic ranges of species to divide them very broadly into abiotic limits and biotic limits. And the abiotic limits refers to the ability of a species to tolerate the environmental conditions, freezing, drought, how much rain do they need, how dry can they, uh, can they um, tolerate. Um, and then the biotic limits is the effect of the other species in the environment. So a species might be able to tolerate the environmental conditions, but if there's a better competitor that is growing faster, then it's going to be, um, you know, it'll be locally extirpated and not live there. So it's that combination of being able to tolerate the abiotic conditions and then how they react to the competitors or predators or pathogens, or if it's an animal, it needs to have food so that the 
so that the plants, for example, be, you know, become one of the biotic factors that determine where an animal lives because the animal needs food to eat or it needs um, whether it's eating plants or eating other animals. So this is where ecologists start when they, um, yeah, they sort of think about this problem. Now, for climate change biologists, uh, we have increasingly focused on the climatic niche, which is to say these, these larger scale geographic factors that determine geographic range limits. And, and one thing that we often leave out, which is just worth noting, is, is how important soils are. So um, soil variability is incredibly important in California, especially at a local scale. You know, you, a, a species might need a particular soil, but we have to understand that within the context that they can tolerate the climate in a given zone. So if we go back to a gradient like the Sierra Nevada, and let's pick out one vegetation type, the lower montane forest. So this would be ponderosa, sugar, um, Jeffrey pine, and the associated species. At the lower edge, you'd have some black, black oak mixed in. And then when you get up to 1,500 meters or so, approaching 2,000 meters, the black oak drops out. So it's that mixed forest. And what we see, especially in a Mediterranean climate zone or a semi-arid zone, is that the, you know, the classic interpretation here is that the upper end of the range, it's getting too cold for the species. At the lower end of the range, it's getting too dry. And this is very much a characteristic of, um, of, the, of a semi-arid region where it's very dry at lower elevations. It's interesting in wetter areas, like in the Eastern United States, we might think of it being too cold at the upper end, but often at the lower end, we focus more on the fact that there may be competitors where there's just other species that are growing faster. So there's a classic view in ecology that species distributions are limited by abiotic factors at one edge and biotic factors at another edge, and, and which often competitors. In our very in our more semi-arid climate that's less clear because it seems like too dry and too cold are both pretty important problems that we know affect these trees now i will say though that in an observational sense you know we may know that these trees drop out at a certain temperature and we might think that if you know as climate's warm they can move but that still might be because the climate is affecting a competitor so that's that when we split abiotic and biotic, as we often, often in science, we try to split things for clarity, but sometimes we're trying to pull things apart that are completely interacting, right? So it's a bit of a false dichotomy because what if the, what if the climate affected a competitor and now the plant can move, you know, at one level it was a biotic effect that changed at one level it was abiotic. So not to confuse things, except to say that our attempts to simplify and separate things uh, are often confounded in the, in the real world where everything is tied up together. So we think a lot about geographic conditions. Now, to step back, when we think about the biological responses to climate change, individual organisms respond physiologically, right? I mean, it could be just maintaining your temperature when it gets too hot in a heat wave. We, we, you know, we sweat or a tree is wilting or using more water. Um, one really important response is phenology. As it gets warmer, we're seeing plants flower earlier, birds return from migration earlier, butterflies emerge earlier. So this is the entire area of study of the what are called phenology is the timing of these events. We're seeing evolutionary responses. We see genetic adaptation to new conditions, species, natural selection, you know, changing climate changes how natural selection is operating and genotypes adapted to drought, you know, or adapted to warmer temperatures, maybe doing better, for example. And um, we may return to talk about that in our uh, later on. Then we see population responses, populations decline, increase, and then as competition is affected or diseases are change, we can see changes in ecological communities. And then at the largest scale, we see geographic range shifts as species. And that's really the scale I've been emphasizing in, in this entire workshop. And that's what we'll focus on um, really for most of the, for our, our discussions about responses and about conservation. There is evidence of, and I'm only going to give you two case studies, uh, more and more appear really every year in the literature, both in California, but globally. The, the evidence globally is, is, is sort of overwhelming that species are either moving north or moving uphill, and more and more studies come out. Here's one that really caught my attention, and this is looking at this, this Conifer, this mixed uh, mixed conifer zone in in the Sierra along the, the slope of the Sierra Nevada, 
And there's a balance between conifers, mostly ponderosa pine, and black oak. And black oak definitely doesn't make it up to the higher mountains. This work, th this work on looking at species shifts really depends on having historical data. And there are not very many great historical data sets. And when we find them, they are just incredibly important. This is based on the Wieslander vegetation maps. So Wieslander was a, um, a a botanist and vegetation mapper hired by the government to do and, and mapped much of California in the 1920s and 30s. And now we can go back and map vegetation again and then compare it to his maps and see where things have changed. So the, the blue on these maps, mostly you see it on the left, is where Ponderosa Pine was mapped as being all across the landscape, and it's still there. And this is about 60 years later. The red was mapped as Ponderosa Pine in the 1930s, and now it is no longer pine forest. And then the green, these small patches, are places that were not pine and now they are pine. So the green is where they're moving and the red is where they're contracting. The oaks, on the other hand, that live at lower elevation, it's mostly what we see is green. So this in this, in this box of the Sierra Nevada, areas that were a lot of the pine forest have converted and are now um, more oak woodland. So we see change happening. And of course, you know, these are done at very high scale with these vegetation maps. We can't get down on the ground and verify, you know, point by point, but they give us at least a big picture. There is something incredibly important to remember in maps like this. And, and, and it's easy to get a little sloppy about how we talk about this. We say they're shifting uphill. So does that mean that squirrels have been grabbing acorns of black oak and like running up the Sierra Nevada and dropping them and they've grown in the last 60 years. That seems like a lot of movement if we're relying on that, uh, you know, on that dispersal of acorns. And the point is, it doesn't necessarily require that because these are vegetation maps. So if you had ponderosa pine forest with scattered oaks, you would map it as a pine forest. If the pines die out and the oaks become more common, you come back later and you map it as an oak woodland. So that's a very, very important ecological change that really is, you know, it's a vegetation change. It doesn't mean the species moved uphill. It just means the species where it may have occurred already has become more common. So it's always important when you are thinking about and talking about and hearing people talk about species moving north and moving uphill, were they really not there at all? So they had dispersed and get there or were they just uncommon? And what we're seeing is that they're becoming more common as conditions become more favorable. Another classic project, and this is um, really kind of the the um, gold the gold standard really of, of uh, for this research on the animal side. Again, a California project. Um, Joseph Grinnell, the first director of the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology at UC Berkeley, was an incredible field collector and trained generations of zoologists who followed him and traveled all over the state doing very extensive collections and very detailed field notebooks and actual physical collections in our museums. That allowed researchers starting in the early 2000s to go back and revisit sites where Grinnell had gone. And again, his notebooks, notebooks were very specific, revisit them and they were sampling for small mammals and small birds and look for changes in these communities. And, and again, in this case, there was very clear evidence of species movement and and again, remember, if you're sampling mammals, you go out for a night, you put out a few traps. If you didn't find them once and you found them another time, it doesn't mean they weren't there the first time. It just they weren't common enough to be picked up. So it's it's always very hard to know if something was absolutely absent versus it's just becoming more common and we're detecting it. But looking across 28 different mammal species here, uh, I'm, I'm going to move quickly in this one and just, and just uh, tell you that the green bars, the y-axis is elevation. And basically what they're showing you is the white is they were there in the past and they're still there in the present. The green is they've expanded. So they weren't in there in the past. So all these bars that are green on the top are uphill expansion. Again, what we expect under climate change, but there's a downhill expansion. So it happens. And then the red, all of these red on the bottom are contraction from the downhills, maybe getting too hot. That's what we expect under climate change. Sometimes we see both contraction and expansion. But then there's some things for, that contracted from the high elevation. And I won't try to unpack these. The biologists who've done this have tried to uh, have worked to understand some of those changes, but there is a really important lesson. Biologists love diversity. This is what 
keeps many of us in this business, the beautiful diversity of the natural world. And part of that diversity is all the species never behave the same. So we can see consistent trends that certainly give a signal of what we expect from climate, but there's always exceptions. And sometimes understanding the natural history of those exceptions becomes a really important clue to understanding the causes. Like now we can understand why the physiology or behavior of this species meant that it didn't respond the way the others did. And that's, that's often a real clue to understanding the system. So those are just two examples from the past. Now, how do we do the future? So I showed you how climate modelers build, you know, those very kind of, those models that take into effect, take into account all of the physical factors to project climate. Now, for projecting how plants and animals will respond, we have a couple approaches, but there's one which is uh, um, simple in some ways. In other ways, maybe it's going to look a little complicated as I unfold it. But it's really more of a statistical approach. So we're not modeling the physiology. We don't know all the complexity of how wet or how dry the species um, requires or can tolerate. But what we do know is where they live today. And we can use where they live today and where the climate is and just say, well, where will, those, where will the climate be in the future that that species can tolerate? And just do it as a simple kind of, if the climate moves, we think the plant will be able to move or could live in places. You know, if it can get there. So I'll just run you through how we do this work. And this is uh, now we're getting much more into what I've done a lot of in my own um, research career. So here we have a bunch of specimen locations for California Bay, um, Umbellularia californica, a very familiar tree in California. <clears throat> and of course, it's not a complete range map. This is just where we have direct observations that are documented in specimens, in this case, specimens in our museum collections in our herbaria. And then we have the current climate. And we combine these two into a, into a model where we say, well, let's take the climate from each place in California. And, and there's some underlying statistics, so don't worry about the units here. But basically, this axis has to do with temperature, cooler to warmer. This has, axis has to do with rainfall. This is the classic pattern in California, hot and dry out in the deserts. And then you get these tails of points as you go out the different mountain ranges as it gets colder and colder at high elevation, but often a little bit wetter. And then the center of California sort of sets here in the middle. So the red points then are the actual observations. So the black is all of California, the different climates that exist. The red is where California Bay exists. So now we can picture, you know, if climate changes, well, we know the kind of climate this species apparently likes, and we just say, where is that climate going? There is another detail, and I've spent a lot of time in, in, with my research group thinking about this. Look at this edge here. So that means there's nowhere in California that's warm and wet. That would be more tropical, for example. That just doesn't exist in our landscape. And we could explain that in terms of the underlying maps of climate, but the fact is it doesn't exist. So here's a question. Here's California Bay's climatic niche. These are the conditions it can tolerate. Can it tolerate this condition right here, you know, where my cursor is? Maybe, but we have no evidence because there is nowhere in, in California. So there's actually this really important phenomenon of realizing that the, the set of available climates is actually finite and not all conditions exist. So we often have no data about where species may live in future climates because an analog of those climates may not exist today. And then we're left really with some guesswork. And that's become, it's, it, that's become more and more recognized what these limits are to our knowledge because of just how sort of the idiosyncrasy of this climate space. Set that aside for the moment. So we have this model and then we have, and then we can take the model and project it back onto the map. So now the red is a range map of California Bay. So we're saying that all these dots are where we observed it. The red is where we think it would live given the climates it can occupy. And in fact, this fills in a lot of gaps where we know that they, in fact, do live. We just don't happen to have a specimen. So that helps us model out, you know, the whole range of the species. Then we take future climates, okay, take them from those climate projections that we've been talking about, take the future climate, combine with the model, and then we get a projection of where the species will live in the future. And what do we see? In this case, the model says that, that California Bay could disappear from much of the Sierra Nevada foothills. And this is under a less severe climate future and a more severe climate future. So the red would be the overlap. They live you know, where they can live in the present and live in the future. 
And under high, under high severity scenario, there's almost nothing left of overlap. The yellow, on the other hand, become places where they do not live in the future and they could live in the present. We believe, we think. So here we see the projection that they could go uphill in the Sierra Nevada or they could go north. And then the question becomes, can they get there? How fast can they move? This kind of work led my lab to thinking about the problem more abstractly. Let's not think about the plant. Let's just think about how fast the climate itself is moving. And that becomes our first estimate of how fast the plants or animals would have to move. And this is a concept that we introduced in, in my research group that we call climate velocity. It's become very widely used in, in, in this kind of work. And basically what we're saying is how just if, if you if you're sitting on the ground and it's a certain temperature, how fast is that temperature moving? How quickly is it shifting across the landscape? And the basic result is that climate moves much more quickly in flat areas. And it's moving slower in the mountains. Now that might be counterintuitive at first, but what it's saying is you don't have to move very far going up a mountain to get to a cooler place, but you have to move a long way if you're gonna drive north to get to a cooler place. So in that sense, I, I think that's more intuitive or you can just drive to the beach and it might be cooler, but if you're gonna drive north, you're gonna have to go a long way north like to Oregon or Washington before it gets cooler. So climate velocities are faster in flat places, slower in the mountains, and the slower the better, because the slower the climate is moving on the landscape, the better a chance that plants and animals can keep up. That brings us to this critical factor of how fast plants and animals can move, and it gets to the ecology of dispersal. So now, unlike the case I gave where the species just becomes more common, now we're really asking the question, can they move to new places? Can they expand their range as climate changes? Um, you know, not to dwell on this, but there's just lots of different ways that plants and animals move by wind, they get blown, they get carried by things, if they're being eaten, they get carried by animals. So there's a whole um, you know, wonderful science and natural history of thinking about how plants and animals move. The question is how fast do they move? And this figure, uh, again, comes from the IPCC, a summary of this problem. And what they tried to summarize across a lot of data, how fast can different groups of species move? And how fast is the climate moving? So can they keep up? The units here are kilometers per decade. So divide by 10 to get kilometers per year. And the bar is what we call the median, where half the observations are below and half are above. So for trees, these just these are all almost all are at 10 kilometers per decade or less, one kilometer per year. And you can imagine a kilometer per year for a tree is, and the trees, and let's be clear, trees don't move. Only the seed moves, and a new tree grows and makes seeds, and the seed moves, you know, the next seed moves and the tree grows. So of course the plants themselves don't move. Now, large animals could be, you know, look at this, up to a hundred kilometers per decade, or large predators small animals down at 20 kilometers per decade, butterflies potentially up in the 50 to 100, and even some, this is freshwater mollusks. I am a botanist, so I won't claim to know how fast a freshwater mollusk can move. I wouldn't thought I wouldn't have thought it was very quickly, but of course, when you're in water, things can, can move much faster. Okay, so that's how fast the animals and plants move. Here's how fast the climate is moving. If you're in a flat area with a high scenario, remember that RCP 8.5? If you're in a flat area at RCP 8.5, the climate could be moving up to 70 kilometers per decade. And look, that rate is faster than entire groups of animals, but maybe within you know, the range of possibility of some other ones. If climate doesn't change as fast, or RCP 6.0, okay, now things get a little better. But it's always the flat areas that are high. And then the global averages are much low, lower when you average over the mountains and the flat areas. And you get down into either, so if climate change is less or if you're in a mountain area, you know, you're better off. And it's really, it's in these very rugged mountainous areas where small movements can offset climate that we have the best chance that a lot of the species in those ecosystems can move fast enough to keep up with climate change in the 21st century. And we'll pick up on that theme in the next unit. And that wraps up this module.